that you're making. Um, now, in an iterative life cycle, instead of doing one big risk analysis all the front, what you do is you do a uh, iteration-specific risk analysis, which, of course, can be smaller for each one of the iterations. Um, and, and so you're, 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 it's focused, and the, the effort is less than, um, uh, well, for each iteration, the effort is less than the, the effort required to do in a bigger um, risk analysis. Now, when you get into the Agile world, then what you're typically going to do in the Agile approach is you have a separate risk analysis at the beginning of each uh, sprint uh, or, or iteration for the Agile approach. And then, and that's going to be very lightweight. It's focused just on risks associated with the, the user stories that are being created for that particular sprint and any other non-functional areas that you need to look at. So then it becomes a very, very lightweight um, kind of thing. Now, let's see. Sarah's got a follow-on uh, question here of, uh, can we use this approach with exploratory testing, use the stakeholders' vision to determine what to explore most? Uh, well, Sarah, I actually I do want to see a blended approach that includes some amount of, of reactive testing, such as exploratory testing, in conjunction with uh, risk analysis. But I would actually encourage you to not um, not guide the exploratory testing by the risk analysis, but rather to let the let the testers use their own experience and judgment and um, intuition um, guide their exploratory testing. And, and here's why. One of the risks, if, you, if I may use that word, of any analytical testing strategy, and risk-based testing is clearly an analytical testing strategy, is that the, the analysis can be wrong. In fact, any analysis in, to some extent is wrong. Um, it, the question is, you know, to, to what extent is it wrong and, and how, you know, how big of a deal is that? So in the case of risk, risk uh, analysis, what's going to be wrong is you're probably going to be missing some risk items and you're going to have some risk items that are misrated um, in terms of likelihood and impact. Now, you need to have something built into your process that allows you to counterbalance this, to counteract this. And this is where the reactive or exploratory testing comes in. So what you're going to do is by freeing up the testers to look in areas outside of where you've created the scripted tests using the, um, the, the risk analysis. And when I say scripted here, I just mean written. I don't necessarily mean any level of detail. But we free the testers to use exploratory testing in areas that might go beyond where, we would, where the, our analysis told us to test. And then what we do is we look and see across all of our test results, including our exploratory testing, are we finding a lot of bugs where we said that the likelihood was going to be low? Or conversely, are we finding very few bugs where we said the likelihood was going to be high? Um, are we finding high impact bugs where we said that the impact was going to be low? Or conversely, are we finding low impact bugs where we said the impact was going to be high? Uh, are we finding um, bugs in areas that we just had no inkling about? We have no, no identified risks uh, for those now, it, so if any of those five things is true, and to some extent they will be true, um, that, that those indicate some sort of problem with your risk analysis. But see, it's, it's difficult to find those kinds of things, especially the fifth one, the bugs in areas where we have no identified risk items, without freeing up the testers to say, look, you know, when you're doing your exploratory testing, just look, look wherever you think you ought to look. Don't be constrained to the... Um, to the um, uh, particular um, risks that were identified in the risk analysis. So um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, definitely use exploratory testing as part of the um, as part of your your strategy. But but set the testers free to to go uh, beyond the um, beyond the um, risks that were identified, and you'll get a much better uh, result out of that. Okay, I got a question here from Jason saying, uh, could you specify the quality risk category link? Um, Jason, and to, for the purposes of avoiding a long period of silence as I search around for it on my website, I'm, I'm not going to go do that right now. 
Um, but what I can tell you is if you go out to, if you're on the RBCS website right now, there's an um, option of resources, and that, that generic uh, quality risks list is either on the basic library page or it's on the advanced library page that's accessible underneath that resources um, selection on the uh, on the RBCS website. So you, you, you can definitely find it there. It might take you a while to dig around because there's a lot of stuff there, uh, but it is on one of those two pages. Um, so the, the link is definitely to one of those two pages, and then you'll just have to uh, look around for that list once you get to that page. Um, excuse me. Okay, so um, I'm not seeing any uh, additional questions at this point. Ah, okay, here we have one more coming in from C's. Um, oh, that's a good one. Have you encountered any disadvantages to risk-based testing? Okay, that's a good question, C's. Um, I used to have some disadvantages with it when back when I did when I followed a more formal approach. Uh, when I first got started doing risk-based testing, what I used was a technique called um, failure mode and effect analysis, which is very very formalized. And and the disadvantage there was that it's just a tremendous amount of work to do those um, those uh, spreadsheets that you have to do to do failure mode and effect analysis. And it's easily like 10 times as much verbiage as the lightweight technique that I just showed you. So over the years, I developed this lightweight technique that I call uh, pragmatic risk analysis and management. And that, that really is, it, get, it provides all the benefits without the, the tremendous overhead costs of the more formal techniques. So that's one way to help manage the disadvantages is to use, the, use a technique at the appropriate level of formality. and. Uh, you don't don't waste a lot of effort um, on things that aren't giving you, you know, a lot of incremental benefit. Uh, now, uh, are there specific cases where I can imagine not using risk-based testing? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if if I'm like we our our Sri Lankan operation, Software Test Works, we do outsource testing, right? And in some cases, the uh, the client is going to say look, what we want you to do is test these things. They're going to tell us exactly what to test. That's called a directed testing strategy. By the way, you're following a directed testing strategy when you're counting on someone else to tell you what to test. And that happens in outsource testing, not infrequently. So in that case, there would be absolutely no point in doing risk-based testing because, you, you know, there's no, there's no latitude for discretion about um, what to test. Um, and, and how much. I mean, they've told you what they want you to test and how much. Now, you might ask them, why don't you enlighten me a little bit about the order in which you want me to test things, as they might have done a risk analysis. Um, but, you know, that's that's one circumstance. And I guess the other circumstance that would potentially make this harder to do would be if you have no preparation time. But I do want to point out that on the case study that we looked at, um, the the risk analysis was done concurrent with the start of test execution, and they still felt that they got a lot of benefits out of it. So I would say even in the case where the test execution is starting, uh, or excuse me, the risk analysis is starting late and you know, almost in parallel with or in parallel with the start of test execution, that still doesn't preclude getting the benefits out of it. Um, and